let's jump right into the topic. And uh, again, I encourage people to call in. I like to take calls, and there are no taboo topics here, so call in and bring up whatever you like. Last week we left off um, discussing what is called the microcosmic tree of life. Again, tarot and Kabbalah must be studied in conjunction with each other. They are complementary occult sciences. And what both of these traditions really are all about is understanding the self better. I posted some videos on the podcast uh, for Kabbalah, and last week I posted some additional ones about tarot. And they both uh, attempt to explain that these traditions ultimately are about knowing oneself better. They're about understanding the forces that are at work within the human psyche. And um, the symbolism is all really geared toward that goal, to help one go within, to help one understand that which is at work within oneself. The better we know ourselves, uh, the more we are in tune with really the forces at, of nature and the less we are able to be manipulated externally by those who do understand the human psyche and seek to uh, twist and manipulate that knowledge and use it for their own selfish aims and agenda. Uh, and they can only wield that knowledge as a weapon if they are doing that uh, against ignorant people, against people who are ignorant of self. So this tradition is an allegorical and a symbolic one that needs to be understood as such uh, in order to really hammer that message home and to open up one's mind to the understanding of these rich symbols that are very complex and multifaceted and need to be contemplated upon in order to be understood. So with that having been said, I want to direct everybody up to my website to either the podcast section or you can go right to the uh, radio uh, page by clicking the uh, listen live button on the left hand side of the site and there you will see some images uh, for tonight's show. If you do that on the radio page, if you go to the radio listen page, underneath the player you'll see a link for five images and um, uh, you can click those and bring up these images to follow along with some of the concepts I'll be talking about tonight. Increasingly on the show, I will be relying on putting up some imagery along with each show so that people can follow along because we're really going to be getting into symbolism much more. And this is why I chose this, this break. We were discussing methodologies of mind control, but I chose to uh, put a break in, into that and uh, instead break down these two occult traditions as sort of an initiation into uh, a higher awareness about uh, the occult and its symbols um, because this will act as a prerequisite for the later section uh, which we are going to get into in a couple of weeks when we talk about subversive symbolism as our 13th method of mind control, a technique of mind control, that being the language of symbolism used subversively against the human consciousness. Uh, after we break down symbolism, we will have all the necessary tools to understand uh, the occult aspects of one of the most uh, vile attacks uh, and examples of false flag terrorism ever to take place uh, in this country or in the world for that matter, the events of 9-11-2001, which we will be breaking down in the future on this show when we talk about the 14th and final methodology of mind control that I'll be analyzing called chaos sorcery, um, which is my term for the basic uh, very dark usage of the Hegelian dialectic or what uh, other researchers have termed problem reaction solution, a term I believe coined by the researcher David Icke. I call it chaos sorcery because uh, I believe that is more akin to what it really is all about because it is driven by occultists who understand uh, the mechanisms of fear. And uh, these occultists employ this technique to great success and again, this all of the breakdown of, of this symbolism and the symbolism that I'll be breaking down in the next section is a prelude to understanding uh, that event as a dark occult ritual. 
And that can sound far-fetched to some individuals based uh, on where their consciousness is right now, but that's what this show is all about. It's about putting building blocks together to help people to understand uh, the tapestry that exists and help them to understand events that are playing out in a higher light of consciousness and reason. So with that being said, what I want to start with is if we look at image number one on the site or on po the podcast from last week, which, uh, whichever uh, section you happen to be referring to on my website, you will see the image of what is called the microcosmic tree of life of the tarot. This is a card arrangement that is created by the first 11 cards of the major arcana of the tarot. This is one of the five subdecks of the tarot, the major arcana. The word arcana, again, simply means knowledge. So this is the higher knowledge of the tarot deck because it explains the forces that are existing within the individual unit of consciousness, or the, in other words, the individual person or being, okay, what is called in occult, different occult traditions, the monad, the one, okay, the one unique droplet of consciousness within the ocean, okay? So, in other words, this is the very small or the microcosm that is a reflection of the very large or the macrocosm, which are the universal natural law forces at work in nature. And today, that's what we'll be largely breaking down, the, the macrocosmic tree of life of the tarot's major arcana, which is the second half of the major arcana, the, the second 11, the second uh, group grouping of 11 cards, because there are 22 uh, cards of the major arcana subdeck. Okay, So we'll be looking at the, the second half of the major arcana cards tonight in depth. Before we do that, and again, th this, this macrocosmic tree of life is represented in image number two. Okay, so that's largely what we, we will be referring to. I also posted three other complementary images to understand some of the symbolism and some of the concepts that we'll be breaking down. Um, and those are images three, four, and five on the site, okay, for tonight's show. Uh, one of them explains, or visually depicts, I should say, how the Kabbalistic Tree of Life is a direct corollary. It is an allegorical and symbolic corollary for the chakras of the body, the energy centers that exist along the spinal column that are associated with uh, glandular activity that basically regulates consciousness within the body. Okay? So th these seven chakras, which is, and this is from a Vedic tradition, chakra simply means uh, spinning wheel or, or vorte vortices, vortex, okay? Um, this tradition is uh, uh, an ancient tradition thousands of years, that comes down to us from thousands of years ago uh, through the region of the world uh, known as the Indus Valley, and this is where uh, India is now, okay? So um, it's an ancient uh, occult tradition, spiritual tradition, and it relates to the Kabbalistic tradition. Uh, as we have seen in previous weeks, I won't go into a full review of that, but as we will also see again tonight uh, when we break down the macrocosmic tree of life of the tarot. The fourth image uh, represents uh, the, the, the connections between Kabbalah and tarot and the four worlds of Kabbalah as they relate to the four subdecks of the minor arcana of the tarot. I hear the uh, intro music for this first break. So we'll get back to that right after uh, these messages. I'm your host, Mark Passio. You're listening to What on Earth is Happening on the Intel Hub News Network. We'll be right back, folks. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are back on What on Earth is Happening. I'm your host, Mark Passio. Uh, I was told during the break that we have a caller online through the um, Blog Talk Network, uh, Kathy. Uh, Bob, you can put her through. Do we have Kathy on the line, caller? Yes, yes we do. Hi, Mark. Glad to talk to you again. How are you this evening? Hi, Kathy. How are you? Wonderful. 
Uh, you were talking about symbols, and I find that very interesting. But I hear everybody all over the net, and you're so hung up on the symbols. I like your information a bunch. But they sit there and they chat. Oh, like the symbols are going to jump up and going to smack them or something. Oh, that has a symbol on it. Well, oh, it didn't get me out. I, I see symbols everywhere I go. And I haven't been attacked by any of those symbols yet. Now, which is good. Don't worry about the symbols so much. Sure. Yeah, uh, yeah. The people. Yeah. a lot of people don't understand that symbols also have dual meanings. And they're, they get hung up on one interpretation of them. And, and often it's a negative, a very negative interpretation of the symbol. And a lot of people don't understand that very same symbol can have a positive interpretation as well. Have you heard of the Dewey Divil site? They have a, a site, and, and they post it. It's called oneevil.org and oneheaven.org. And they have so much information there. Do you have an email where I could send you some links? Sure. You could send uh, any information that you have to mark at whatonearthishappening.com. Mark on earth is happening. Mark what on on earth is happening. happening. Okay, I'm going to let you go ahead with your show because I wanted to send you some news. Great. I appreciate it. You have a great evening. You too. Thank you, Kathy. Great. Okay. So uh, anybody else uh, wants to call in, uh, you go to the top of the list. Uh, I, I tell Bob just basically put the callers through or let me know and uh, you know, they'll get priority. Uh, so back to the, the uh, breakdown of some of the symbolism of the tarot, and hopefully we can uh, do this effectively enough that we see how powerful some of the symbolisms could have on our understanding of ourselves and the forces that are at work in nature. Uh, what I want to start with is image number one, okay? Um, actually, before I do that, I was just wrapping up the, the uh, breakdown of some of the images that are up on the website, the, uh, image four and five. Image four is a very simple chart. It shows the Kabbalistic tree of life and how the uh, minor arcana cards, which we talked about as the other four subdecks of the a whole tarot deck, uh, how they relate to what were, were called the four worlds of the Kabbalistic tradition. And we broke those down a few weeks back. Those were Asiya, which is the physical world, Yetzira, which is the mental plane, uh, Bria, or the emotional uh, aspects, and then Atzaluth, which we uh, call the plane of will, or the spiritual or archetypal plane. So uh, those corresponded, of course, to the elements, uh, that, those being earth, air, water, and fire, respectively, and they corresponded to the four uh, subdecks known as the minor arcana decks, and uh, the material or uh, resources, the material world or resources that we have to work with or our talents and abilities uh, correspond to earth, which that was the coins or pentacles uh, subdeck of the minor arcana. Um, the suit of uh, swords corresponded to air, okay, the air element, which is about the intellectual capacities that we have. Uh, the suit of cups corresponds to uh, the element of water. Okay, this is our emotional makeup. And then, of course, the suit of wands corresponded to the element of fire because that's our actions. That's what we actually do in the physical world, the actions that we take uh, based upon what we know and how we feel and the resources that we have and the talents that we have in the physical world. So... Um, that, that, that is also broken down according to uh, what most researchers would call the power that is inherent in these suits or in these subdecks because the least powerful thing is simply the material substance or the, the resources we have to work with. We often attribute that to the, the most important things, but uh, these are actually the, that's actually the lowest in power. Uh, our intellect would be the next most powerful thing as we go up this ladder. Okay? Then the emotions which guide the intellect have uh, you know, the next uh, even more power allotted to them. And then finally, ultimately, it's all really about the kind of actions we take. What we actually do with our emotions, which ultimately uh, govern the ways that we think and the ways that we use our resources that we have at our disposal. So the most important of these four principles uh, and uh, represented by the alchemical uh, element of fire, 
is our actions, and that would be the suit of wands in the, in the minor arcana. So um, that's uh, an image that you could uh, take a look at. That's image number four there. And uh, we also, uh, you know, uh, related these worlds to the Hebrew uh, name of God, which is the, the tetragrammaton, the four-letter uh, name for God, uh, which is Yod, Hey, Vav, Hey, um, starting from the top there, uh, the Yod character, and then uh, go, moving downward, uh, Yod, Hey, Vav, Hey. And uh, this, if we transliterate into the English language, is uh, transliterated as YHVH which uh, comes down to us in the English pronunciation as Yahweh or Jehovah. Again, names for God in the uh, Judaic tradition. So um, that's image number four. Image number five is uh, a workup that I did uh, based on the Wheel of Fortune card, which we broke down pretty extensively last week. And we talked about the hidden words that are comprised of the four letters that spell out the word tarot, T-A-R-O, and if we complete the circle, go back to the T, T-A-R-O-T. So um, I just showed there all of the words and where their uh, etymologies come from, uh, their actual root uh, language. Well, you know, all the different words that can be made from those three letters uh, in, in order, okay, in different orders, and uh, what that actually says to us in the contemplation of this particular card, which is all about what the tarot is. It is the wheel of fortune. Okay? It is the wheel of truth, as I've termed it in this, in this slide. So the word rota is there, which means wheel, and that comes from Latin. The word rota means wheel in Latin. Tarot itself is a, a truncation of tarot, T-A-R-O-T, -A, a derivation of that word. The word arot in Latin comes from uh, the verb aro, arare, which means to cultivate or to grow. Uh, orat, O-R-A-T, means to speak from Latin oro, orare. Okay? Uh, Torah, T-O-R-A, it comes from the Hebrew, which means law. The Torah are the first five books of the Bible in the Judaic tradition. Uh, and finally, ator is a variant of hathor, which is the Egyptian goddess of love. So putting all of these words together, a sentence actually comes out of these uh, different variants of these four letters, and we, we get the sentence, the wheel of tarot cultivates. It speaks the law of Hathor. Or, in a, in a different translation of that, we could simply say, the wheel of tarot brings order by telling us the law of love. That's what this tradition actually is all about. It is helping us to understand the forces at work around us that I have called, and many other people throughout history who have studied these principles have called natural law, and our relationship to these governing forces. Okay? So we, we've looked at the monad, or the individual unit of consciousness, last week in the microcosmic tree of life. Now what I want to do before we get into the macroscopic or the universal forces is I want to briefly recap two of the cards from last week that I don't feel I went into enough depth on and that is the high priestess and the magician. Okay, cards two and one in the deck. Now on the site underneath the images you'll see a related document. Okay, and this is a PDF document I think it's about six megabytes. You can download it from my site. And it's just, it's every card in the tarot. And I used uh, the, the uh, Universal Weight deck, uh, originally designed by uh, Arthur Edmund Waite. And uh, this deck is, uh, you know, a basic deck. It doesn't get uh, into super esoteric uh, symbolism. It, it shows all of the critical symbolism of the tarot. I think it's a solid deck to use to understand the symbolism of the tarot, and um, I like the richness of the colors of the cards, which is why I chose it to put up there. There are so many different tarot decks out there, but uh, this one is good for a beginner just studying the tradition. Uh, I think my favorite deck happens to be, um, just as an aside, my, my absolute favorite deck happens to be the Golden Dawn Magical deck, and I was just lucky enough to be able to pick up a copy of this deck uh, it's out of print, 
and a lot of people who have this deck want a lot for it. Um, but the, the symbolism on that deck is very rich. The colors are super vibrant, and it has a lot of different uh, attributions to uh, astrology, the uh, Hebrew uh, letters of the Hebrew alphabet, um, uh, the alchemical symbols uh, embedded on the cards of the major arcana, and it's just one of my favorite decks. But I uploaded this deck because I think it's ultimately simpler, and it's better for beginners who are just looking into the tarot, uh, and, and I like it better than the standard Rider weight deck, which is the one most people will be familiar with, simply because I think the recoloring of this deck uh, is just much more vibrant and the, the, the colors jump out at you. So uh, that document is there. All 78 cards are listed on the pages of the PDF, uh, and you can download that uh, on my website. So um, the the... Card number two of the Major Arcana, the High Priestess, this is who the tarot is essentially uh, dedicated to. Again, we looked at the name Tara and its different derivations coming down to us through different goddess traditions over the centuries. And uh, that, that's what this book is ultimately, and the tarot is a book, okay, because it's many, many concepts encoded into it, which you can discuss at length. So that's technically a book of symbols, okay? They're encoding tons and tons of concepts into this rich symbolism. We said a picture is worth a thousand words, a symbol is worth a thousand pictures, and a series of symbols uh, uh, coming down into this encoded tradition that we call the tarot is worth millions of words, okay? So um, when we look at this symbolism of the goddess, uh, this is who the tarot is named after. This is Tara, the goddess herself. Um, and uh, I, I hear the, this music playing. We've been having this problem on the network. I'm not sure where this is coming from. Let me see if Bob can locate this. Uh, one more. No, we're not up to a break yet, or at least I don't think we are. Could be wrong. Okay, there we go. It stopped. So that that actually has been happening. I don't know if that's a problem with some computer on the network, but that has chimed in over some. You know what I'm thinking of it, Mark? Yes. Every time I put my uh, Skype call in a hold, if I go to another Skype call, mm -hmm. I think maybe because I'm lo logged in, I'm still on the switchboard, but because I'm logged in and I put it on hold somehow, it, it switches that music on, and uh, I'll probably see if that, uh, if I don't, uh, well, let's test it real quick. Yeah, that uh, might be a setting, that might be a setting somewhere in Skype if you go into your control panel. Well, it has something to do with, um, do you think it has to do with my Skype? Uh, it's possible. I don't, I, I'm not really certain. I, I don't. I haven't used the feature like that in Skype, but it is possible. Right. Real quick, tell me if it comes on. Hold on. Okay. Let's see. Yep. Did it yes. come on? Yes, it did. So that's that's what it is. Oh, yeah. Exactly. All right. Well, cool. Well, we identified we it, it anyway. It We'll stop nope. that interruption from now on. No problem, Bob. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, so going back to the uh, the High Priestess card, this is card number two on the uh, Major Arcana of the deck. And um, if you look at the card of the High Priestess, you will see that this uh, goddess figure who represents Hathor or Isis or Semiramis or any of the uh, or Mary or any of the myriad of other names, Diana. Uh, you can go on and on, Aphrodite, uh, you know, Ishtar, uh, in different traditions that this goddess was uh, revered. What she ultimately represents is the forces of natural law, and she represents truth itself, okay? And she sits enshrined and veiled between these two pillars, and we talk about these pillars as being symbolic in many different occult traditions. Of course, we understand that they are the pillars of uh, severity and mercy in the Kabbalistic tradition. 
in the tradition of Freemasonry, they are the pillars of Boaz and Joachim. Okay? So uh, again, they are listed there, or they are labeled there, I should say, with the B and the J, as the, the pillars of Freemasonry often are. Uh, this also represents the two tribes of Benjamin and Judah in, uh, in uh, Judaic uh, tradition and, and ancient Hebrew tra traditions. So she is holding the Torah, which is the book of law. Okay, this is natural law. Upon her chest, what would be her heart chakra, is the cross. Okay, this is showing that uh, she bears into existence the, the Savior, okay, the sun, the light. Okay, that comes out of the void which the goddess often represented. We talked about this extensively when I went into the breakdown of different astrotheological traditions. Okay, so you can go back and refer to that in the section about religion and astrotheology, which was several podcasts back. All these topics are listed on the podcast page. You see that she is associated with the moon. The crescent moon is at her feet. The flowing dark robes, again, always a, a, a symbol that is given to the goddess uh, because she is the goddess of the night sky. Okay? Uh, we see that she is crowned, again, the queen of heaven, okay? the, the, the lunar goddess, the moon, the dove. We talked about the moon being a symbol uh, depicted by the dove in ancient occult traditions because it is the white uh, dove that, that crosses the sky that makes the journey across the night sky. Okay, again, this is a symbol, not to be taken literally as a dove. Okay? The Kabbalistic tree can clearly be seen behind her upon the veil. She sits within the temple, and this is the, te the symbolic temple of Solomon. Again, this isn't an actual building, as many people insist that it is. Okay? It is a symbolic building that is about our brain and the makeup of the human psyche. Okay, it is the left brain. The pillar of Joaquin represents the left brain hemisphere, the logical male solar brain. The pillar of Boaz, or the dark pillar, okay, represents the right brain hemisphere, the lunar forces. It represents the, the uh, yin energy. Again, the pillar of Joaquin would correspond to the yang energy. This is the male uh, dual aspect of consciousness. And we need to bridge these two and bring them together into a synthesis if we are going to arrive at harmony with truth or natural law, which is with what this goddess represents symbolically. Okay? So, again, and the veil is there because it is telling you this isn't something you see readily. It is something that needs to be penetrated. It is something that needs to be, to, to, you need to go within to discover because the temple represents the self, the higher self, and you don't reach oneness with that sacred feminine force or energy and natural law principles and truth until you go deeply into the self, which is what the Temple of Solomon represents. So I hope that cl clarifies more what this card represents, and it corresponds on the microcosmic tree of life in the Kabbalah to the sphere the Sephira, known as um, Chokmah. Okay? Chokmah in the Kabbalistic tradition represents wisdom. So this goddess figure, this symbol, helps us to get in touch with the wisdom that is the knowledge that we have accumulated about all of, all of uh, the aspects of ourselves and about natural law, and then to take proper moral action in the world based on that knowledge. That's why it is on the pillar of mercy, which is the masculine pillar. Okay? If we correspond this to the, uh, the, the, the microcosmic tree of life in image number one, it would be at the top of the right-hand side, all the way at the top. That's called the pillar of mercy, as we uh, talked about it when we stud looked into the Kabbalistic tradition, and the very top card on the right-hand uh, pillar on the Kabbalistic tree, or this microcosmic tree of life, this, that represents the sephira known as Hokmah, which is wisdom. And wisdom is actually applying that which we know and have taken into ourself as our understanding. Not just understanding in and of itself. That's the sphere on the left side. That's an internal quality, and that's the sephira known as Binah, 
okay? Or understanding, just simply understanding. Wisdom is understanding applied in the world. That is why this card comes just before the highest level of the macrocosmic tree. Taking proper moral action in the world is the thing that puts us the closest to the cosmic consciousness itself, represented by the very top of the Kabbalistic tree, okay, which is Keter, or the crown, okay, becoming truly illuminated. Okay? Unity consciousness, bringing all of the forces at nature under one's command which is the magician. Okay, so this is the very top of tree number one. So we're still breaking down a couple of things on the microcosmic tree to set up our journey into the macrocosmic tree tonight. Okay? The magician card, he is crowned, as you see, because he is connected with the concept of the crown, or the keter sephira, on the top of the tree of life. He is illuminated. He is covered with white. He may be wearing a red and white robe, but he is completely surrounded by a white glow. This means he has become the illuminated one. Okay? And people think that the word Illuminati always means something negative. It does not. There are positive illuminates in the world. Okay? People who do know the self. People who have mastered their internal forces, represented by the four um, objects that are uh, placed upon his table under his command, yet he needs not wield them as weapons because now he is connected to the true wand or scepter of power, which he holds in his right hand. This is a, an analog to truth, wisdom, and unity consciousness. Okay, The concept of as above, so below is also depicted. He is connected with the higher self through the wielding of that scepter of power, okay, representing he has conquered himself, the lowercase s self, and he, he rules the kingdom of self. Okay, as we've talked about the concept of dominion, he has dominion over himself, the only thing you're allowed to have control over. He controls his own thoughts, his own emotions, his own actions, and he has brought them into unity. He has brought them into unison with each other such that he has become a being that as he thinks, so he feels, and so he acts, and there is no contradiction between these three aspects of his consciousness. Okay? So the four elements are under his command. The four elements of the material world is under his command. This is what, in the Christian tradition, Jesus, the words attributed to Jesus in the New Testament, what he said when, he said, when you uh, make the eye single, okay, when you, when you make the two into one, okay, when you bring yourself into unity in what he termed the kingdom of heaven, right, that you can say to the mountain, mountain move and the mountain will move. The, the, the command of the forces of nature, of natural law, are on the side of the one who has achieved self-mastery. And this is all about the self. This isn't about serving any other god. This isn't about serve. You know, different dark occult traditions can twist it into that. But I'm trying to teach the pure, original um, uh, uh, tradition of what these cards were originally intended to help the initiate or the student accomplish, which is to know oneself and to come into unity consciousness, to become the ruler of the kingdom of self, so I heard the intro music. Yes, uh, we're coming up to our second break here. So that's a good place to uh, break it. And uh, we will continue with our breakdown of the, uh, the, the uh, macroscopic forces of the macrocosmic tree of life when we come back after this next break. Welcome back, folks. We're back here on What on Earth is Happening. I'm your host, Mark Passio. Before the break, we were talking about the magician card, uh, which is the top of the microcosmic tree of life, the first tree of the tarot. And um, 
we're going to start getting into the breakdown of the macrocosmic tree, which is the second 11 cards of the major arcana. So uh, just one final word about the magician. You'll see he has one arm pointed up and one arm pointed down. Again, this is a reference to the, uh, the principle of correspondence of uh, hermeticism and uh, the idea that the universe is self-similar across scales and that the uh, microcosm is a reflection of the macrocosm or that the very small is a reflection of the very large and vice versa. So um, this is uh, also represents that he is plugged in to the energy of higher consciousness and he is bringing it through himself, through his actions in unity consciousness that he actually takes in the physical domain represented by his hand that is pointed down toward the earth. Okay, so uh, when one has achieved this state of self-mastery and understands what their work is here on the ground, uh, they act in this capacity to bring those higher levels of awareness down to others who are also in the physical domain. So it's, uh, it's acting as a conduit, I guess you could say. He's a vehicle for that, the transference of energy from higher states of awareness so that he can uh, uh, help to act as an alchemist, to act as an influence on other people who are still in the material identified state of consciousness in the physical world. And uh, we need more magicians, folks. We need a lot more magicians. That's all I have to say about that. Again, uh, the, the fool is in the position of Da'at, which is the hidden sphere of knowledge from which the, uh, the tree of life uh, actually emerges. This is the no thing, and we talked about that last week. And the fool in this position represents the soul and spirit itself uh, as the, uh, the source, okay, the connection to the source or the higher uh, self. So... Um, let's look at the macrocosmic tree. This is image number two that we're going to, not on the uh, tarot book, but on the website, the second of the five images that I posted. And you'll notice that it looks very similar, except there are a new set of cards in the positions on the tree of life. And these are cards 11 through 21. Now, the first card of the major arcana is the fool, which we just talked about what that rep represents, and he is in the position of dot, and he was colored white because this is not on the tree of life or considered one of the emanations of the tree of life, but it is uh, from whence the tree of life comes, okay? Uh, simil similarly, on the macrocosmic tree of life, we take the last card of the major arcana, card number 21, Okay, the very last card, because again, this brings it full circle. The beginning corresponds to the end, and the end corresponds to the beginning, and it works in a cyclical fashion, as we are going to see as a theme throughout occult uh, schools of thought. Okay, um, and we see the circle again, or the zero, okay, representing the no thing, right? The, with this wreath of this card. Now, if you're going to look at this on the tarot document, you're going to skip ahead to what is called Major 21, the Major Arcana 21. That's what the uh, image will be termed on, this, uh, on the, uh, the page of the PDF document. And it is simply called the world. So this is image number 21 in the Major Arcana, and it is called the world. In some decks, you will see this called the universe. Okay? So... This is the, the, the playing field, so to speak. This is the actual physical world that we live in, but it is also the spiritual world. There are no real separations between those things. Okay? People have termed this the body of God, the unified field, um, the all. It doesn't make a difference what you call it. It is the, micro, it is the macrocosm itself. Okay? It is the all. Okay? So... Again, it is here depicted with this goddess figure that we saw on card number two. But this is, um, this is the, the, the womb of creation, okay? So it represents the void itself. You know, the all springs from the void or the no thing. It's not really physical. We talked about that when we talked about uh, physical worldly identification of, through matter, how people get 
so left brain identified that they are they are purely identified with the physical world only. But this world is anything but solid. We looked at some uh, aspects of um, of uh, uh, quantum mechanics when we looked into the section on uh, ego identification and identification with materialism. I called that section of my, of uh, of um, understanding the, the, the understanding of the barriers to the realization of the true self. And that was many, many weeks back, but again, you can go back in the podcast and check that out. Uh, the, these barriers to self-realization included something I called five sense illusion, okay? Identification with purely material, um, physical reality. And if we look at the uh, particles that comprise the physical reality, they're nothing nothing but solid. Uh, they're not solid at all. They're actually pure energy in, vi in a state of vibration. That's all it is. It's condensed to a lower state of vibration, and we call that physical matter. But uh, what this card is basically telling us symbolically is that really there is no material world per se. Okay? It's all a spiritual construct. It's a construct that we experience through mind, okay? like a lens. And it's therefore experience and learning and growth. Okay? And that's what this uh, goddess figure that represents the pure potentiality okay, of everything um, represents. And you see then that's brought into, she's in that doorway, which is represented by this wreath. Okay, that's in the form of a zero, just like the fool card was card zero. This is a, a correlation to that card. The, the as above, so below, or the correspondence principle brought here again, because uh, the soul and the universe are essentially one, and they are reflections of each other. The microcosm reflects the macrocosm, and vice versa. So we see the angels of the corners, as we described last week, the lion, man, bull, and eagle, representing Aquarius, uh, uh, I'm sorry, representing Leo, Aquarius, uh, Taurus, and Scorpio, the, um, the um, ruling houses of the quadrants of the zodiac, uh, the ruling houses of each pr uh, respective season, um, uh, summer, um, summer, spring, uh, fall, and winter. And um, these are the arms of what is called the Great Cross of the galaxy. And again, the galaxy is also connected, as we saw when we looked at the astrotheological traditions, particularly when we looked at the Islamic tradition and its connection to astrotheological um, uh, concepts and worship, was uh, the, the galaxy is connected to the goddess, which is the goddess of pure potential and the void. So we have all of these connections brought back on this card uh, representing our position in the galaxy, representing um, the, the void of nothingness from which the material reality ultimately springs because it's all energy in a state of manifestation that is derived from pure potential. Okay? And sh she has two wands of power or two uh, forces, because this goddess is the bridge between the microcosm and the macrocosm, okay? She ultimately is the one that is in control, if you want to look at it that way. This is, these are the forces of nature itself. This is the goddess that represents natural law. The, the, the governing forces of our reality that you're not going to break and get away with, period. You're bound by them, the end. We've talked about this innumerable times throughout the shows, and I'll continue to mention it, but there are still people who don't believe there's any such thing as natural law principles that believe that they can do whatever they want in this reality and get away with, and they're delusional people. Um, natural law is always in effect, always has been in effect, always will be in effect. You're bound by it forever and ever, the end. Um, good luck thinking otherwise. That's why, that's why suffering exists, ladies and gentlemen. Suffering exists because the people in this world who think that they're God and think that they own and control these forces, which they don't, uh, refuse to acknowledge their existence and refuse to acknowledge that they're bound by these laws. Nonetheless, that happens to be the truth. They are, 
we can come to understand these forces and work in harmony with them, or we can continue to flaunt them, continue to ignore them, in which case we're going to continue to suffer endlessly. The end. Get over it as fast as you possibly can. Okay? That's it. And, you know, I, 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 I'm not going to even belabor that point because we, I've talked about it endlessly on the show. Go back and listen to some podcasts where I talk about natural law and even podcast number 36 in which I break it down in, in a presentation. So um, this goddess represents the forces of natural law, okay? And that's what the world is governed by. And it, these laws are not derived from simply the physical. Again, that's why it, the, the zero symbol is there, okay, representing that uh, these are derived from the realm of potential or the realm, the spiritual realm. They're not, you can't see them by studying just the physical world. You have to have a more holistic, all-encompassing worldview in order to discover these laws. You're never going to discover them just in left brain logical analytical science. Okay? You need the wisdom of the right brain hemisphere, the sacred feminine, which is a, an analog to the goddess herself, uh, a, a, a bringer of higher uh, aspects of consciousness through the nurturing forces, through this, the, the, uh, the emotional qualities of the self, and you need to bridge that with the analytical and logical qualities of the left brain. That, that, those can't be thrown out, those masculine forces. They need to be bridged and combined into a synthesis with the qualities of the right brain. And that's why she holds these two scepters of power, okay, which uh, she is this bridge between these male, masculine and feminine forces. She controls the whole game. It is natural law. And you can look at that as a feminine nurturing mother, not a, not a strict disciplinarian or a vicious, uh, you know, uh, control freak or anything like that, because these laws are not put into effect as a prison. They are put into effect as a guide, as guidelines on how to conduct ourselves and to reach self-mastery so we do not have to experience suffering. And this realm can become the paradise that it was intended to be. Okay, so let's start the breakdown of this tree, and uh, this goddess, or this world card, is put into the position of Doth, again, as the, the hidden sphere on the Sephirotic tree, to represent that this is where it ultimately all comes from, okay, and goes to. It's a flow in a circle, represented by that wreath around this goddess figure, okay, and that's my best attempt at a breakdown of the world card. So let's build it up as we have done in the microcosmic tree from the base, from the Malkut position. And again, if you need a reference to these, these words, you can go back to the images of the, uh, the, the uh, tree of life in the Kabbalah section. You can bring those images up on the website. Okay? Th again, this is a, uh, a building block uh, form of study and teaching. You have to grasp the concepts and some of the jargon uh, in a previous teachings and study, and then we are going to continue to use that as we go forward. So again, this is a stepwise progression. That's what we have to understand. That's what initiation is. Initiation is taking these building blocks and then stacking them, and then stacking them, and stacking them, just like you build a building. And this is how we build an understanding, a deep understanding of self. And that's all these symbols are for, ladies and gentlemen. You can't build them into something that they're not. It's not a religion. It's not a belief system. It's a tool. That's it. It's a tool. Symbols are ultimately tools. Now, they do have an effect upon our, our subconscious and conscious minds. But you know what? They do that more so if we're completely ignorant to the language of symbolism. Once we understand and become symbol literate, we can understand how symbols in any given position or aspect are being used. That's the key to their true decoding. Okay, Not just looking at the symbol itself and saying, oh, that always represents this. No. A symbol may be used in one place to represent something, and then it can be used in a different place and represent something altogether different.
depending on who's using it and for what reason. We need a more mature understanding of the language of symbolism. I can't stress this enough. And too many people in the so-called freedom movement who think all the occult is negative, it's all horrible, it's all of the devil, it's all, you know, satanic, do not understand because they have not really initiated themselves into this rich language of symbolism and these teachings, and they do not understand that these can be applied for to be a, a force of great good. And I'm sorry, but I, I, I'm never going to admit or acknowledge that some of what these people are saying, that it's all negative and it's just all trying to put spin on something that's evil, that's not the case. This is a child's interpretation of something that they know very little about. Okay? And you'll know who I'm talking about, and you can, you can go out and look at all different kinds of researchers that, that talk about this as purely being negative. Okay? Now, knowing what I've come forward and said on this show about human freedom, do you think I would come and start to teach a tradition that is purely negative and can only be used for ill? Of course not. Okay? I'm, I'm trying to help people gain a more holistic understanding of what the occult really is and what it's really used for in its pure form and what it is being used for in its adulterated form. Okay? Because there's a world of difference between those two usages. And again, I think we need to grow up and we need to be a little bit ma ma more mature about this. Okay? So with that having been said, let's break down this macrocosmic tree now. Okay? In the Malkut position, which is the very bottom of the tree, okay, for the people who haven't yet, I guess, mastered the jargon, and again, these are just Hebrew terms from way back that relate to concepts. That's all. You don't get caught up in the jargon. Okay? We're looking at the very bottom or the base of the tree along the middle pillar, okay? Uh, that's depicted there in red on image number one, uh, uh, on image number two, I'm sorry, okay? So this is the judgment card. And if we look, at, if you're following along with the PDF document, um, you go to the judgment card. This is card number 20. That's in Roman numerals, two X's, okay? And it says judgment on the bottom. It's an angel with a trumpet blowing the trumpet. The trumpet has a cross attached to it. And the, there is a man, a woman, and a child rising from sarcophagus, from, from sarcophagi, the plural of sarcophagus, okay? They're rising from tombs. Let's just call it to be simple, okay? And... This represents the call out of purely material identified consciousness, okay? From base, mundane, material world is all there is, state of awareness. That's what this represents. That's why it is in the Malkut position in this uh, ordering of these cards, okay? Now, again, these are the forces of nature that are at work. These are all natural law principles and forces. We have a choice whether to go along with this calling. This is a, a wake-up call. That's what this card represents, a wake-up out of base consciousness. And that's why it is the very bottom of the tree. You can't really do much of anything or make any movement upward in consciousness until you at least hear and begin the process of responding to this call, which is the initiate's journey okay, toward higher spiritual understanding. That's what this card ultimately represents. The cross is a symbol of crossing over to something new, a bridge. You cross a bridge, okay? You go through a gate. You make a crossing. It's a journey from one paradigm or one worldview, one way of seeing the world to another way of seeing it, okay? That's why the cross there depicted with the horn that is a vibratory energy. Some researchers like David Icke have called this truth vibrations. And I love the term. I love the concept. I love the way he describes it. You should read his book, Truth Vibrations. It's fantastic. His first uh, book that he put out uh, after his wake up to this form of uh, vibratory consciousness. Okay? Uh, great person. Uh, it, it, unimaginable level of courage to do what he 
does and stick with it through all of the ridicule he's gotten over the years. He's, he's one of the people I consider an, in, an influence and, a, and an inspiration because of his courage to speak his mind regardless of what anyone thinks of him. And I'd like to think that I go in, in those footsteps, so to speak, because I don't care what anybody thinks of what I say and talk about. You know, I'm going to speak it, period. So this is what the judgment card is about. And it's not a negative card just because it says judgment. It's, it's the beginning of our exercising judgment of wanting to know the truth. Okay? If we don't do that, then it can be seen as a negative card because then we are going to experience the judgment of natural law when we ignore it, refuse to uh, come into understanding and cooperation with it. Again, two, two meanings. A lot of times symbols have dual meanings. So, again... We go along with this wake-up call, we exercise positive judgment, we can rise up from our state of being dead, okay, spiritually. And again, this is what the dark occultists call us. They call us the dead as a, as a whole. That's what they refer to the mass of humanity as the dead. Wonderful, wonderful people, okay? Um, and they do this because they say if you're in a state where you're, Thoughts, of emotions, and actions aren't in unison, okay? If you're a, an ignorant person, if you're an apathetic person, if you're a lazy person or, and a coward, you're essentially dead. All of the soul qualities are dead, and so you're dead. You're in, you're in a, a coffin. You're in a sarcophagus. You're completely dead. You're identified with the material realm. You can be conditioned. You can be manipulated. You can be put into a state of hypnosis and trance at will and, you know, put on strings like a puppet. And, uh, you know, they own, they own you. When you're in that state, you're, you're a complete slave to their form of, uh, of dark manipulation in consciousness. And that's why they call people like that the dead. And I 100% concur that they are dead. I'm, I think it's a horrendous thing. I think I'm, I get angry when I even think that people are that wicked, that they talk about living beings like that. But is it true? Absolutely it's true hard thing to admit. I didn't want to admit it for years of my life. But I, I can say when I'm wrong. And this is, the, 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 the real state of humanity isn't people waking up with their arms out to this call. This is a, po a more positive interpretation of this card. Most people are lying in that coffin with the lid closed. Okay? That's not me being negative. That's just the truth. That's just how it is right now. It's our goal to help to sound that alarm, which is what the angelic force is doing as a wake-up call to come out of this completely deadened state of awareness. Okay, so I hope that helps to clarify the symbolism and deeper meaning of that card. And again, these are my deeper interpretations of, of these cards based upon my study and my initiation into the occult. And it, it's a very holistic and um, uh, integral interpretation okay, from many different traditions and points of view and, and um, um, uh, perspectives. So I, I want to help the audience to keep that in mind. There will be other interpretations of these symbols. Uh, you should, you should uh, engage them all because no one's word is final on any of this. This is an exploration and study of the self. That's infinite, okay? The universe is infinite, and so is the soul, so is the spirit, and so a study of these cards is infinite, all right? Just that, to say that as a caveat uh, to the further study of this tradition, all right? So let's move to position number nine on the, uh, the Sephirotic tree, which is the sphere of Yesod, okay? And that's the foundation card, okay? Malkuth, of course, the red uh, judgment card, that position, that re represents what's called kingdom. Malkuth, that's what it means. We go up one to this orange card. It's called the sun. Okay? And again, this would be the equivalent of the, uh, not the base chakra. The base chakra is that judgment card. That's Malkuth. We go up one to the sacrum chakra. Okay? This would be the, some people call it the genital chakra. Okay? The sacrum is the desire center. Okay, so that's what the sphere of Yesod, or foundation on the tree of life, represents. 
okay? And this is the sun. So this is the force that is calling us up out of that base level of consciousness, okay? This is the light, okay? The force of light calling us up out of that pure material identified consciousness, okay? And again, we see it is the symbol of the sun, okay? We saw how this is connected with the Christian tradition. We saw how the sun was connected with the Christian tradition in astrotheology. It's a solar sect of astrotheology. The moon, which is the next card, which we'll get to in a moment, was the Islamic tradition, okay, the lunar sect of astrotheology. The star was the Judaic religion. That was the stellar cult or the stellar sect of astrotheology, the, the, the cult of the stars and the planets, the, the, the lesser lights of the heavens, the smaller lights of the heavens. So these three cards actually act in conjunction with each other in this triangle when we, we saw how that relates to the worlds of the Kabbalah. This lower triangle represents Yetzira. Yetzira is the, form the world of formation. And again, these are the formed objects that represent the, uh, the, the, the heavenly bodies that comprise the material world. Okay? It's the, 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 the stars, the planets, the moon, etc. Okay, these are all of the heavenly bodies on which uh, life depends and on which life lives in in the cosmos. Okay, so we see that this corresponds with the formative world known as Yetzirah in Kabbalah. This these this triangle formed by the next three cards: the sun, the moon, and the star. This the sun in particular, okay, represents the force that is calling us up, the light calling us upward out of that base level of consciousness represented by uh, the, the Malkuth or judgment card, okay? So this is desire. We need desire to move forward, okay? That's connected with the um, sacrum chakra, okay, or the planet Jupiter, as we saw when we looked at the, uh, the connection to the uh, tradition of the, the Vedic chakras, when we put, when we superimposed a solar system with our solar system with the pl planetary attributions on each chakra site. Again, this is all a connected tapestry, and I would highly encourage people to go back and uh, l listen to the podcast and work with the imagery. That's its key. Contemplate it. Understand its deeper meaning and its deeper message to the self. Okay, through the self. All of this imagery should be contemplated on. Don't just look at it once or just, you know, dismiss it or, uh, you know, give it a cursory examination. The best thing to do is actually get a deck of these cards, lay them in these positions, uh, and work with them in a, in a mode of contemplation. And I guarantee you, insight will stream in, okay, if, if you're really taking it seriously. And it will help you to understand better things that are really going on within. And again, that's what this is all ultimately about, ladies and gentlemen. Okay? So, the sun card. Okay? Um, that's what's, again, uh, pulling up, pulling us up. It's, it's what the angel is working on behalf of, really, the light. Okay? The forces of light. Now, the moon and the star are in the... Uh, solar plexus chakra position. Now, on the Tree of Life, these are the spheres of Hod and Netzah, okay? So Hod on the left, which is the pillar of severity, and Netzah on the right, the pillar of mercy. So we have an internal aspect and an external aspect of will, of light, okay, of the forces of evolution calling us upward out of base consciousness, which is represented by Malkuth. And this is saying that we need to activate the will. These cards are in the will center positions, the solar plexus chakra, and therefore they're colored yellow. Okay? So the moon represents that we need to have, we need to connect, okay, with the higher forces that help us to develop courage. Okay? And the, one, of the, one of the properties that enables that is getting in touch with the sacred feminine force within us or the right brain aspect, okay? And again, that's what this left-hand pillar, the pillar of Boaz 
or the, the black or dark pillar, ultimately represents. These are all the internal, sacred feminine, yin forces of consciousness, okay? Indwelling. Now, this is what the lunar principle is all about, and hence the moon is on that pillar of severity, okay? Corresponding to that, but acting in the complementary, or some would say the dualistic role, because this is a dualistic chakra center that has two basic principles, courage and will, is the star card. Okay, So the star card is on the active side, and it's shown this would be connected with the concept of the water bringer. You see this uh, water bringer pouring water out into a, 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 a lake or a stream and has one foot in the waters, one foot on land. This is, again, bridging the material and the spiritual worlds. Okay, This is telling us, yes, while we need to develop courage within, and while we need to use the spiritual principles that we don't actively see in the physical plane, we need to do that work on the ground. Okay, So this is about taking action. It's the solar plexus center. Okay, It's about courage and will. And that's what this star card in this position is basically symbolic of, that we need to keep you know, one foot in the spiritual plane, one foot in the physical plane. Okay? We need to be in this world, but not of it. And the work that needs to be done here needs to be done on the ground, on the game board floor, so to speak, which is the material plane. We can't get caught up in this idea that because we understand that our true nature doesn't lie in the physical world, that there's nothing to do here. That's nonsense. This is a cop-out. Okay? This is a cop-out of the right-brained imbalanced, or you know what I just generally refer to as the new age the New Agers that have, uh, you know, uh, gone too much into a state of right brain imbalance, all right, thinking that there's nothing to be done here because they don't identify anymore with the physical world. Nonsense, okay? We need to make that connection to the, the spiritual realm, but understand that there is work to be done here in the physical plane, and that's what we are tasked to do, to change the manifestations on the physical plane, because the physical plane isn't really separate from the spiritual plane. Okay, it's just that same energy condensed to a lower vibration, so that uh, so that uh, experience may be had, and knowledge can be gained, and growth uh, and progress can be can be made. As we move toward higher and higher levels of awareness, moving back toward uh, true unity with the all. Now. This star card, again, represents that understanding that we need to be rooted in both worlds. We need to act as a bridge between both worlds and how important it is that there is actual action that needs to be taken in the physical domain, that we cannot ignore that. Okay, So that's what we're talking about now, the yang forces at work. Okay, So this is the, the male aspect of the, the, the natural law forces of creation, okay? And again, that's why this is on the male pillar, or the pillar of mercy, as it is called in Kabbalah, okay? So it would be the sphere of Netzah, okay, which means victory. Okay? The sphere of Hod, the moon card, means splendor, okay? Now, we move up now to the tower card, colored in green, because again, this is associated with the heart chakra, it is the balance point of the tree of life. We talked about the color green being the middle of the visible spectrum, being the balanced color of nature, being the color of the heart chakra, the Anahata chakra in the Vedic tradition. Okay? This card in the macrocosmic sense, the tower, represents the force of change. And the universe is change. That's why it is a hub. It is the central hub of the macrocosmic tree. Everything is in a state of change at all times. This is what the universe means. The word universe means the one change. It comes from uni in Latin, a prefix which means one. Okay? Unity, bring to oneness. Okay? Unison, etc., etc. Okay? It means one, uni. Okay? And versare, 
The verb versari in Latin means to change, and there are people who, you know, want to belabor this point, saying, okay, you look it up in a Latin dictionary, it says to turn. Well, it doesn't mean to physically turn. It means to turn in the sense that leaves turn into another color in the fall. They change colors. To the seasons turn from one to the other like a wheel, okay? And that's what it represents, okay? Change is what bursari ultimately means. The universe is the one thing that is constantly changing in a state of dynamic flux. That's what the word actually means when we break it into its etymological constituent elements, okay? This tower card often represents sudden change. We see the crown being blown off the tower, the people you know, falling out of it, it being on fire again. You could see the correspondences here to 9-11. We'll talk about this card when we get into the symb symbology of the 9-11 event. But what this card represents ultimately in this macrocosmic sense, according to the forces of nature, is that the forces of nature are ultimately governed by the principles of change. And we cannot stay in a state of consciousness that doesn't want to accept change, that wants to always keep things in a, uh, seeking to keep things in a steady state. And we're, we're going to experience suffering if that's the case. Things are always changing, and our minds have to be fluid and go along with that change. Otherwise, we're going to be like the oak tree in the wind that snaps when the wind gets too powerful. Okay, we need to be fluid and be willing to bend with the forces of nature as they are coming in and affecting uh, our consciousness. And that's what we're really experiencing right now. The, there is a different vibratory state that is attempting to come in here and change things, and there's so much resistance to, by the people of this planet that don't want to change because so many of them have vested interests in the way things are, and they've been running the show, and they've been controlling things, and they don't want anything to change. They don't want thing, things to become different or more egalitarian or um, you know, uh, more free. They like it in the controlled state that it is right now and have no problem with it continuing on like that into the foreseeable future. Okay? But ultimately, the people who are serving that force, that dark force, are going to snap like the oak tree snaps in a tremendous wind. There is no stopping this force. The, the, the higher will of the universe is going to see its will done regardless of what we want or any of us want here. That's what people have to understand about this. Everybody's going to ultimately get this. You don't really have the choice. So if you want to look at it in the highest aspect of it, free will, yes, you could say is an illusion. The only thing that how free will really applies is how much will you either cooperate with that force that's ultimately in control of this whole game, or how much will you try to go against it? in which case you'll create an, an enormity of suffering for yourself. If you happen to step into that slipstream, that flow of energy, the, the world can become like a paradise because you're getting the lesson that is intended by ultimately the higher will, which you can call it whatever you want, the unified field, the, uh, the uh, dynamic intelligence that underlies all creation. You can call it God. I don't care what you call it, okay? But you're not going against that force and ultimately winning. And the problem is the bulk of humanity is going against that force, and somehow we think we're going to escape unscathed. How I describe this force of change uh, that's represented by this tower card, um, imagine that uh, the, the, the forces at work in the universe are like um, uh, a hand, okay, and they're attempting to guide and shape, uh, let's say, a huge uh, aspect of uh, a huge um, amount of clay, okay? You remember, um, uh, this is a nice uh, anecdote that helps explain this concept. You remember uh, Silly Putty or um, uh, what do they call it, Play-Doh, right? Play-Doh, everybody played with this uh, stuff when they were young, different colors of, of uh, you know, uh, soft clay you can mold and they had molds for it you could press it through things you can make spaghetti you can make shapes everybody played with this at least people you know kids that uh i guess grew up in the same era as i did who are probably in their mid-30s now you had this stuff when you were young you, you definitely had to okay 
Uh, and you would put it through a, a mold. You'd squish it through, and you know a shape would come out the other side. Well, that's what humanity is. And the forces of nature are the, the, the forces of change represented by this tower card. And what the universe is, or what this big change that we're trying to uh, go through, that we're going to go through, is like a mold, or let's say it's a wall, right? And it's got a it's got a shape cut out, right? So, the, the this big ball of clay, right, needs to go through this wall. It needs to go through the shape. Let's say it's shaped like a star, just to be just to have uh, you know a, an image in mind, right? And the natural law forces or these new vibrations coming in are saying, well, here's the big bulk of humanity represented by this ball of clay, this play doh, right? And it needs to go through this star-shaped gate or portal, okay? And there is no choice as to whether it's going through. Oh, it's going through. The question is, is it going to, while it's on this side of this gate or portal, is it going to realign itself and streamline itself and mold itself of its own volition and its own free will into a shape that is conducive to going through the uh, the, the shape, the cutout, right, without being splattered up against the wall and forced through, okay? This is why we call it a force of nature. Force. It's going to be forced. Make, you don't have a choice in natural law progression. It's a force. This is why it's called a force of nature, ladies and gentlemen. There is no choice to whether comply with that or not. It's going to happen. The only choice is how much damage happens on this end of the transition. Where do we streamline ourselves? And do we already mold ourselves into a new form and we go through peacefully? We'll be right back after these messages, folks. Go ahead, Mark. Okay. All right, so we were talking about the tower card on the macrocosmic tree of life before we went to that last break. And we saw how the tower card uh, at the hub, the heart chakra location, represents change. And indeed, as we've talked about many times here, the uh, aspect of care okay, is the generative principle. It is what actually creates the reality that we experience. Okay. And again, this is the um, central aspect of the uh, triangle that forms the uh, world in the Kabbalistic tradition known as Bria. Uh, I'm sorry, known as um, <coughs> uh, above, uh, yeah, um, no, yes, Bria is the, is the creative world, okay? So this is the world above yet zero, which is what we talked about with the three um, uh, uh, cards, the sun, the moon, and the star. Uh, this world of the triangle that is formed by the tower, the devil, and, temp and the temperance card, okay, formed the world known as Bria in Kabbalah, the creative world. And again, this connects back with the, with the generative principle, okay, of care and how much we align ourselves with the forces of natural law. So the devil card, okay, which is the next card upward on the tree of life on the left-hand side, on the middle of the left-hand pillar of the tree, okay? This is on the pillar of severity, and this card is in the position of the sephirah known as geburah, which means severity. And indeed, it is a card depicting severity. The devil card ultimately represents, in its highest aspect, going against the forces of natural law, okay? So this is our free will decision not to engage higher levels of awareness, not to engage self-knowledge, in which case we in have the option to enslave ourselves. And you see there the two beings, the male and the female, that are chained and subordinate to the devil, represented, uh, the, 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 representing the Satan force, okay, which is the force of fear, which is the force of um, uh, devolution in, in consciousness, okay, yet Look at the chains. Look at card number 15 of the major arcana, the devil card, okay? It may be a negative card in its, in its uh, connotations and its implications and its symbolism, but there is hope 
in this card, actually, because the chains are set lightly around the neck. They're not fastened super tight, choking the two beings, the, the male and female. They are put upon them themselves. They could lift these chains off of their neck at any time. See, this symbolism is very specific. It indicates that we have the free will choice to discontinue our current ways that are basically flying in the face of natural law principles. We can do that at any time. We have the free will to do that. And we can go over to the temperance card, which represents, again, an angel, okay, with the, the flow. This angel has the flow of energy going. It is the alchemy card. Some decks call this alchemy. Some decks call this simply art, A-R-T, the art, okay, as you'll hear some occult sciences referred to as particularly alchemy. So this is the alchemist card. This is the on the pillar of mercy, the right-hand pillar, the right-hand path. And this temperance card it represents the sephiron known as hesed, which means mercy. Okay, so these are the central hubs of these two pillars, and they represent going along with natural law or refusal to go along with natural law. So that's temperance is becoming the alchemist it is uh, accepting the natural law forces. It is the, the positive aspects of natural law which are there to teach us, are there to help us to evolve. Okay, so you can look at, this is natural law itself, these two cards. And one, rep, and one represents our choice to go along with it. One represents our choice to uh, disengage from it. Okay? And both of them are connected to the tower card in this triangle of Bria as the creative world because this is how we create our reality. We create our reality through either the learning of and acceptance of natural law forces or ignoring them, in which case our life becomes severe. If we accept them, we understand them, we accept them, and we live in harmony with them, we go toward the pillar of mercy, and life becomes a flow guided by angelic forces, okay? If we go along with, if we refuse to go along with natural law forces that are there really for our betterment, okay? We enslave ourselves, but we can choose to undo that at any time because the chains are not set tightly, okay? It's our free will decision to fly in the face of natural law, okay? And we are ruled by the Satan principle, okay? which is the opposer, the adversary, the one who tears us apart from within because we are ultimately a non-unified uh, non being. We are, exist in a state of duality, okay, depicted by the man and the woman separated and chained, but they have chained themselves. And that's what we're doing. That's the path we're on, folks. You want to know where humanity is? You want to know the best example of what humanity is right now? It's card number 15 of the Major Arcana the devil card. That's what we've done to ourselves. No one has done it to us. We've done it to ourselves. Okay? And people will disagree with that, and they'll pound their fists on the wall. They'll pound their fists on the desk. They'll curse my name for daring to say that. It's other people's manipulation. It's just this is all something being done to us. We're victims. Poor humanity. We're victims. Well, you keep going right on ahead with that apologetic worldview, okay, and keep making excuses and keep pointing the finger outward, okay? And I'll keep helping people by helping them point their finger inward because that's where change happens. That's why the change card is on the middle pillar and it's associated with the heart, ladies and gentlemen. That's where change happens within the individual and it's a one on one work that needs to be done from within with each individual person. Nobody can do it for you. They can only inspire you or influence you or help you, but you have to do the work yourself for change. Okay? So that triangle helps explain the creative forces at work in the world. Now we go up to the top triangle, 
the world of absolute, and I hope I can explain this in 10 minutes. We'll see what we can do. If not, we'll carry us over a bit into the next show. Uh, a brief word. Next week, I was going to do the presentation I recently gave on the Wizard of Oz, but I think I'm going to hold off on that a little bit uh, because I think there is some more prerequisite symbolic understanding to go into before we could truly really understand that. Now, of course, I didn't, you know, lay out all of this symbolism to the people that I gave the lecture to, but on the show, I kind of want to keep it to a progression, and I think we should go into the symbolism aspects before even we cover uh, the uh, occult elements of the Wizard of Oz on the show. So we'll do that in a few weeks. Uh, I'm going to start getting into the symbolism, and uh, I, I was thinking about the idea of just having a, an all-caller call-in show. You know, I haven't done that on the show yet. Uh, we haven't had many guests on. I still look to have guests on on a lot of these topics in the future. We're going to get into solution think in the future, and we're going to go on with that for many, many weeks when we get to the solutions. But um, I think maybe we'll have a call-in show. Maybe I'll wrap up some of the deeper symbology of the tarot and for like the, the first few minutes of the show, and then we'll just do take all calls, all, uh, the whole show. Uh, it's something we haven't really done, and I'd like to do. So, uh, you know, we can get people's take, you know, take the pulse of, of, of the community out there, so to speak. Uh, people think that's a good idea. Uh, we can give it a shot next week. But uh, let's continue with the final three cards. We have at the top triangle the death card, okay, the hanged man, and justice, okay? So the death card up at the top left-hand side of the pillar of severity represents the forces of involution, okay? Uh, this represents uh, the decay elements of nature, that things always move into different forms. Uh, things don't stay the same. Uh, they are always changing into different forms. Energy uh, remains, but it takes on new forms, and you know, life uh, passes through uh, stages where it exists in incarnation, and then it goes back into the no thing, and then back into a state of physical being or incarnation, and that is a cyclical process. So this death card is what you could consider a force of involution. Um, and again, it's on the internal aspect of the, uh, uh, the, the Kabbalistic tree on the pillar of severity, okay? The hangman card uh, would seemingly be a negative card, but I don't look at it that way as anyone who really understands the deeper esoteric meaning. This is the evolutionary principles inherent in creation, and this is the forces of nature uh, coming, working down, coming down through the physical to evolve it, okay, represented by uh, the initiate being put upon the world tree or the cross, okay, this is a crucified being, but he is an illuminate, okay, he is, uh, the forces of nature have been made known to him, and therefore he has this halo around his head as an illuminated being, and he is not actually suffering. This is the, the evolutionary forces coming into uh, the flesh, I guess you could look at it as, coming down through the spiritual world and being grasped, grasped while in the flesh. So this is an initiate who has understood natural law, and he understands that while it may bind him, um, it is uh, something that is there for our evolutionary development in consciousness. And it is that evolutionary force itself that this card represents in the macrocosmic domain. Okay? The hanged man card. Card number, um, um, what is that? Uh, that's uh, 12, I believe. Um, my, yes, 12. Okay? So moving upward to the top level of the macrocosmic tree of life uh, of the Kabbalah's major, of the Tarot's major uh, arcana, we have card number 11. Okay? And this is justice. Okay? This is the card that represents balance. This is the card that represents truth, and this is the card that represents equilibrium and justice, and that's why it is called that, okay? This is the goal of creation. This is what the universe is seeking to accomplish. This is the end result of the great work, as it is called in the hermetic tradition and the alchemical tradition. 
The state of equilibrium, you see again, it's a king seated between two pillars. He holds the sword of truth in his right hand. Proper moral action has been attained. Somebody is released from basic law. They are king now. They are the, the ultimate sovereign being the king because they do right for the sake of doing right, not because they are bound by law and consequences. Uh, ultimately, this is the, the state stage of evolutionary development that the higher will of the universe that is driving all of this, uh, all of this um, movement, all of these forces, is trying to put into place. It wants balance. It wants equilibrium. It wants truth. It wants justice. And that's what this card ultimately represents. And you see the scales of truth and justice there, along with the sword of truth and the crowned king between the two pillars as an evolutionary synthesis between the cosmic male and female forces or the yang and yin energies. Now, in older decks, this card was actually reversed with the eight card, which is the strength card, or the card that represents courage. And this card was put into the position on the microcosmic tree of the sphere of hold, okay? Um, in newer decks, these cards are reversed to reflect that the courage principle is part of the microcosmic tree and that justice is the ultimate goal of the, of the universe itself, of the, the macrocosmic forces at work, okay? Now, I agree with the current um, placement of the cards as you're seeing them on these images. But the reason that uh, older occult traditions reverse these cards is because they crowned courage as the ultimate force of creation, as the ultimate thing that the universe was trying to create because without it, nothing really changes and gets done. And we've emphasized over many weeks how important courage is uh, to the spiritual journey. So I would say that these cards are almost interchangeable as well. I, I prefer to tend to uh, go with the arrangement, again, as you see them on the images I've depicted. However, uh, when you look at certain tarot decks, you will see these two cards reversed, and that is why. This is an, an homage to courage itself, saying that ultimately this is what the universe reveres above all else. And I couldn't agree more. So I understand why this reversal was done. People often claim that this is a black magic reversal or something like that. It's nothing of the kind, okay? Uh, this is done because uh, they were alluding to what the ultimate thing that we need more than anything else is, and that is courage to move forward in consciousness. Uh, and when we do that, we'll become the sovereign king, the justice card. And uh, that's ultimately what the universe wants to give us, freedom, true freedom is what this card ultimately represents. And um, uh, it represents, again, being rising even above law to the cosmic consciousness position. Okay, this is what the universe is trying to ultimately create. And it's freedom from law itself, even the natural law, okay? Because you won't need to be bound by the, the, the repercussions of going against natural law because you'll follow it simply because the recognition that it is simply right and goodness and justice, okay, will be enshrined, okay, as king. That's all, that's all we really have time for here tonight, folks.